hope calamity, the countdown continues. this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. The 1960s, an age of optimism, of expanding horizons, of limitless possibilities. For the first time, man sees his own planet. On a magical night at Hamden, 135,000 fans see football from another planet. The European Cup final will inspire managers like Jock Steen to reinvent the Scottish game in the coming decade. This was the finest club match ever seen in Scotland, many say in Britain. So here's a glimpse of the magic of that memorable May evening when Real Madrid played Eintracht of Frankfurt. Whoever not blinded by prejudice, Scots are extremely intelligent about football. And they suddenly realised that uh, they were in the presence of marvels. And I've seen standing ovations at cup finals and things, but the only really genuine standing ovation I've seen was for both sides after that match. But it was almost like a theatre where they came out and took four or five curtain calls. There are marvels in music too. In the early 60s, a group of... So I remember that, looking on the pitch and seeing all the Dundee fans celebrating winning the league and just tears flooding down my face knowing that we, we were relegated. Really, really sad. I mean, that was in the days before Scotland had uh, discovered child abuse, but I was standing there feeling the most abused child in Scotland. Television brings such triumphs and disasters into countless homes. Even in 1961, you have to walk a long way to find someone who doesn't own a TV set. You ever seen a television set? No. You never have? Well, no. allow me to introduce you. Oh, I have no time to wait for that. No. You have uh, no time no, to waste no time. on television? The, the, this is the closing. I'm oh, I'm not, I'm not selling it. No. No, no, no. I'm just asking you if you would like television in the islands. Oh, yes, we are. Look first. All right, don't run away. I just want to ask you a question. <laughs> I'm afraid that is the one that did get away. Those without TV sets are lucky because they don't witness Scotland's biggest ever humiliation at the hands of the old enemy in a game which reinforces the myth of the butterfingered Scottish goalkeeper. Wembley 61 becomes the black hole at the centre of the Scottish psyche. Yes, uh, and I was doing my own counting, I must admit. It's 9-3. I mean, that 
must have been a horror for every Scot that made the journey to Wembley. 9-3, I would rather not talk about the 9-3 game. We had Frank Harfey in goal, uh, who a lot of the boys blame Frank for, for, you know, the nine goals. I only blame him for about six myself. I do not want to talk about anything regarding that game. I remember getting kicked in the air by Dennis, Dennis Lord, in front of the Royal Box. Did I? Did I? Did I? I was a young If I did, I was only a young boy. And, and looking at Dennis, and while I said, hey, Dennis, you know, like, you don't do this at Wembley. And he looked at me as if to say, hey, this is Scotland versus England. <laughs> in front of the Queen as well. What a, what a liberty. We were three up at one stage, going like a Rolls Royce. Scotland fought back to their credit to 3 2. And then, unfortunately for us, we conceded a goal which was like 4 2, and then we conceded another one 5 2, and I just wanted them to go home. There's a guy, a wee man selling papers outside, and he was sort of looking at me and smiling. He says, well, typical Cockney, what was the final score? I says, 9 3. He said, Was that at close of play? I thought, you little so and so. <laughs> Poor Frank Haffey is so humiliated, he emigrates to Australia to escape the shame of it all. Is it possible that we Scots ask too much of our footballers? There's still the hope that they will turn into gods with wings of gold, you know, scurrying them from one end of Hamden to the other. And we're also asking them to re-fight Culloden. Bannockburn was OK, we didn't need them there, but they could re-fight Culloden and their way down towards the other goal. Oh, and perhaps they could put right all the indignities and all the injustices real and imagined that this nation has suffered for the last 200 odd years. As well as the 9-3 game, the other major world event in 1961 is the building of the Berlin Wall. With the Cuban Missile Crisis, the world lurches towards the nuclear precipice, but President Kennedy refuses to push the button. The world and the World Cup survive, but Scotland's hopes don't last long. We qualify for a World Cup playoff against Czechoslovakia, having beaten them in this game at Hamden. In the playoff at the Heisel Stadium, we're leading 2-1 with only nine minutes left, when the Czechs score a controversial equaliser. Baxter and Crennan, great friends off the field, then display the Scottish preference for self-destruction. Scotland's doomsday clock explodes, and we lose 4-2 after extra time. At that point of extra time, when we, we were getting a little quick sip of whatever and the sponge. Baxter and Crern then have a bit of an altercation over the sponge. And I remember uh, we said, never mind fighting each other, <laughs> let's get into them. You know, when I think about it now, absolutely madness, but in the heat of the moment, the two is are rolling the ground and they go at each other. And we're going on to play extra time with a possibility to get to Chile in the World Cup finals. Paddy got his sponge out and I says, come on, get spread the bloody hang around, let's get some water out of his. He turned away and I'm grabbing it and we're tussling to get this bloody stupid sponge the middle of the high cell stadium. But with Scotland, it's always that the expectations are so far ahead of anything that's reasonable that you produce a form of psychosis in the players, I think, collectively. I mean, I'm now of the conviction that 11 players in the one, Scottish players in the one size, about eight too many. Self-destruction can be the flip side of genius, as is the case with Slim Jim Baxter, child of the swinging 60s, for whom discipline's a dirty word. If you go out on a Saturday, you play a stormer, what kind of manager you saying the Monday to you? You shouldn't have been with the two birds at the weekend. Shall I tell you about my life? They say I'm a man of the world. I've flown across every time. And I've seen lots of
But you've got to take the consequences. You're either going to be a playboy or you're going to or just live your own life or you're going to have to conform. Well, I just, I just let, I just don't I want it. TV beams Baxter and others into millions of living rooms thanks to programmes like ScotSport, whose outside broadcast teams wrestle heroically with primitive technology and the unpredictable nature of the Scottish weather. On foggy nights, it can be difficult to tell if the pictures are from a football park or the dark side of the moon. But we soon learn the difference. The pictures from the moon are clearer. Skills learnt in such adversity spawn a whole new generation of Scottish filmmakers. At that time, the Scottish film industry, you know, things were, were, we were all working on documentaries and TV shows and things like that, and everybody was saying, when are we going to make feature films? When are we going to make feature films? And Eddie McConnell, who was the cameraman I worked with in the football matches, he said, look, I make a feature film every Saturday. Look, look at all this, look at this drama, look at this humanity that's happening out here. It lasts a day and a half, that's how long a feature film lasts. He says, I make a feature every week. McEwen's is the best, by the best, by the best, by McEwen's is the best, by the best, by in beer. The best, by in beer. Thirsting for revenge, the Tartan army marches on Wembley in 1963. After her last visit, victory would be a real feather in her bonnet. Tell them all, we'll make up for that 9-3 defeat that you gave us the last time we were doing. Easy! We went back to Wembley and Eric Caldo broke his leg in the game. Big Bobby Smith, it was a real, you know, nasty tackle. No substitutes, so with ten men, we went on, back to score two goals and we won 2-1. And for me, that's one of the great victories in the Scotland-England game. It's the first time I've seen the stadium, and the park was just like a bowling green. It really was. I said, this is my stage. And I see a big Jai Bede in the turn down here, and he can kick my ass. Henderson now with Law on the right, backing up, pointing into the centre. Henderson needs to beat his man, which he does. Henderson gets it across. St John, nobody there. Almost a chance for Baxter, but I think he just felt he couldn't reach it. But he does get possession. It could still be dangerous. Baxter for Scotland. Where's the goal? Henderson has it now. Henderson coming through. Puts in field inside the vault. Down he comes. A penalty. Penalty to Scotland. Eric Caldo, the captain, is off. Mackay says to Baxter, it's up to you, Jim. And here comes Baxter to make it 2 nothing for Scotland, we hope. Chance of a lifetime for Jim Baxter. Here he comes. It's there! Believe it or not, that was the first penalty I'd ever taken in, sort of, in any form of football. So it showed, I think, not a bad bit of bottle that. You know, when a Scottish team wins well, it's, it's better than anybody else winning well, because they won like us. You know, you recognise your, your lineaments out there. That was a feature of the game that was worth suffering for. But Scotland have always been capable of the one-off victory, usually before going into meltdown. It takes an extraordinary man to build a team capable of sustained and lasting achievement. His name? Jock Steen. With Hibbs and Dunfermline, he has displayed an uncanny gift for turning ordinary teams into match winners. Billy McNeil's headed winner in the 1965 Scottish Cup final ensures Steen instant glory with Celtic who go on to achieve unparalleled success at home and in Europe, confirming Steen as a major figure on the world footballing stage. In 1965, many Scots believe they have more chance of sighting Nessie than of winning the World Cup, after a disastrous last four minutes in a vital qualifying match against Poland. It's Scotland 1, Poland 0, with only five minutes to go. Yeah, beauty! Oh, Hamilton left, floundering there. Over comes the ball. Missed. And it's a goal. Poland are very deservedly equalised, I would say. Very deservedly indeed. Poland might be advised to try and go for another goal. Greg's evaded. Right egg chance. It's a goal! Poland have gone ahead by two goals to one. And so in a sensational last five-minute burst, it's Scotland one. Fallen two, and Scotland have only themselves to blame.
Now to qualify for the World Cup finals, we have to beat Italy home and away. Steen recalls Jim Baxter and makes him captain in the belief that to beat the glitzy Italians, we need a bit of swagger. Uh, people like Baxter, I had, had the pleasure to play with Baxter, but he had this arrogance. I mean, I remember we played in 65 against uh, Italy, and he was walking about the dressing room before the game saying, Rivera? Who the f is Rivera? We might says, I tell you what, if I don't get four or five nutmegs on him a night, I tell you what, I'm a bad player, I'm telling you. And during the game, this is true, uh, during the game, he's gone, and as he's not making Rivera, he's gone, we man, one. And then, and then, and we man, that's two, right? And he thought, like, to take the mickey out of Rivera was, like, better than scoring a goal for him. I always remember looking up at Hamden and seeing the, the, the lights going on inside the stand, which always told you it was near the end of the match. And it was nil-nil at the time, and I was running up the part of the ball, and I passed it to Jim Baxter. And Jimmy put it back on a six minute piece for me. And really, I would have got shot if I'd missed it. So I just swung my left foot, and the ball went in the corner of the net. But it's obviously it's loved very much in the mind of a lot of people, and they remember me because I scored the goal. We have a decimated squad for the return leg in Italy. A third-choice goalkeeper, no Jim Baxter, and ultimately no chance. This time we don't self-destruct, we're just unlucky. We see Naples and die. Although we didn't play badly in that game, we lost the match 3-0 and away we went to chances of playing in the World Cup Finals in England. Now that there's no World Cup to distract us, we notice that Polaris is in the Holy Loch. This is supposed to make us feel secure, but many Scots feel as exposed as Jack Alexander on a windy hillside, and a cold blast is about to blow up our collective kilt. In 1966, England win the World Cup with a couple of dodgy goals in extra time. Scotland responds as if the school bully has just been made prefect. Well, it was the blackest day of my life. And I honestly thought that I would never, ever get over that. I think I want to live in Scotland on the day when it is quite possible to say, oh, England won, oh, that's good. Because once we've reached that happy state, it means that actually we're not measuring ourselves by any false measurements, that we're taking full responsibility for ourselves, that we're behaving like a normal grown-up country, and that we're prepared to uh, live by our own judgments, our own mistakes and our own triumphs. Hey, I have matured through the years, you know, I have mellowed a little bit, you know, I don't I mind him occasionally winning a game, you know, but uh, in those days, no. Revenge on the world champions is not long in coming as we annihilate them 3-2. Uh, the record books show a 3-2 victory, but it's 3-2 going on 6-1. Oh, it, it was a superb Scottish performance. Don't, don't think I'm sort of knocking it. It was a tremendous performance, especially by Jim Baxter. You know, we were all looking in the record books to see whether he had an English mother or an English father. Well, you couldn't have got a more ripe situation, could you? The world champions. 72 rain to Scotland. I had a few quid in Scotland as well that day myself. 72. Taking the mick out of them at their own ground. A beautiful sunny day. About 50,000 tartan scars waving, chanting, singing. Oh, a different class. This is number six, Jim Baxter. And a chance here for... Tommy Gemmell for Scotland. Moore gets his head in the way and Gemmell has it again. Oh, and a chance here! For... <laughs> Baxter now for Scotland, slowing the game down. Callioc again, Baxter. England just don't seem to be able to take this ball away from Scotland. Scotland slowing it down. Taking the mickey out of this England side. Still it's with Scotland. McCallion. Baxter. And that will be a foul. I would think there somewhere. If people keep asking me why Alan Bob wanted to kick me, he says, I don't have to do all the game trying to kick you. I says, he's nobody in a sense of humour. 
as his accordion, Jimmy Clather, and he took the spar. Do you remember that wee guy with the wee short trousers and all that? He's got a wee squeaky voice. The best side won on the day, played terrific football. I got the biggest chasing in my life by Jim Baxter, who had a fantastic game. And then, uh, not only that, you took the pitch on. Lennox, number 11. Jim McCallion. Oh, McCallion! <laughs> It's a memorable victory, but many feel we should have had more goals and less swagger. Dennis was looking for to get nine goals as his asset of an extract in the urine. He wanted to be England, actually. He wanted to win. But my first and foremost thoughts in a football field was always to entertain. I always wanted to please the punters, give them something to shout about, something different. And they don't have that now. The fans were so happy. That, that, I mean, it was, it was unbelievable. Just the, the joy of beating England and, and, and the way which we did it was important to us. As I say, after the game, we felt like the world champions. It didn't last for too long. <laughs> we declare ourselves unofficial world champions for a day, but the morning after, we'll realise that the old enemy are still the official world champions. Is our famous victory enough? Maybe we've been worshipping false gods. But in reality, the, the people who really control Scotland 400 miles away, they're the fans of the flannel fools. The cricket supporters in England control Scotland. They are absolutely delighted to see Scotsmen emasculated by this game into putting all their energies into thought about this game when they really should be big boys and be running their own country. I declare Winifred Margaret Ewing has been duly elected to serve in Parliament as a member of it needs a woman to take the battle beyond the football field. In 1967, Winnie Ewing of the SNP takes her place at Westminster, an all-seater stadium. This fixture is always held in London, which gives the English home advantage. Attempts to move it to Edinburgh continue to this day. Also in 1967, a momentous event transforms our view of ourselves. Jockstein's Celtic win the European Cup, and the admiration of the football world. Scotland put up a great performance in 1967, but I think there was an even greater performance in 1967 because it was a string of performances by Celtic who became, you know, the first British team to win the European Cup. It's a tremendous... I mean, even at that time, the Italians and that were spending, and the Spaniards were spending fortunes. And there they've got the boys for the Garden Guard and... The Gorbals and Addingston and that, taking them with the cleaners. It's a fantastic feat. The Italians thought they were so good defensively that they could afford to give us uh, the ball and uh, just go at them. There was no way that uh, Inter could give us as much of the ball and hope not to lose a goal because we had so many. It took me uh, personally about three or four months before it actually sunk in that we were European champions. We could hold our head up high, we could, we could boast that we were the first uh, Scottish and British team to win the European Cup. The reception we got at every function from the supporters was absolutely fantastic. And that brought it back to us again. We said to ourselves, did we really know the enormity of what we did? And I don't think we did. What Jockstein Celtic did was to help restore our sense of national pride by demonstrating that you can be Scottish and not self-destruct. Combined with our triumphs over the old enemy in the 60s, this run of Scottish achievements will be remembered by many as the best of times, when we realised you could be Scottish and be the best.